Once again, welcome back, fellow Sojourners, to Appropriate in the Culture, your friendly and comprehensive guide to being in, but not of, and your path through the cesspool of modern life that will leave you smelling fresh as a daisy. If daisies smell fresh, I don't know, I'm not a botanist. On today's episode, we will focus on the family and finally think of the children. Oh, won't somebody please think of the children? Yes, we will. Today. I'm Pastor Shane, I'll be your parenting instructor as we appropriate some culture. As we've said, the culture is influential. Movies, television, music, and entertainment are powerfully persuasive and incredibly impactful in shaping minds and cultivating thinking, which is why Christians desperately need to be engaged in these areas. But even in the limited ways in which we have engaged, it hasn't gone particularly well because we're not really good at it. And a sticking point among the myriad of reasons as to why we're not good at it is that in order to be good producers of art, you need to be good consumers. If you want to be the master, you need to be the student first. But therein lies the problem. How do we learn the tools of influence without being influenced ourselves? How do we study the art of propaganda without being propagandized? How do we research the methods of indoctrination and not become indoctrinated ourselves, especially when it comes to our children? Think of the children. We're getting to it. Because they have mushy, malleable brains, children are easily influenced. They don't know what to think, let alone how to think, which is why every propagandist regime has intentionally targeted children from the Hitler Youth to the more modern children indoctrination efforts like Drag Queen Story Hour, which, as we all know, is meant to inspire a love of reading while teaching deeper lessons on diversity, self-love, and an appreciation of others which are expressed primarily by twerking and reading stories about gay penguins for children aged 3 through 11. Now, of course, you're not required by law to send your kids to the public library for Drag Queen Story Hour, and that's a bit of a problem because how else are your children going to learn the deeper lessons on diversity, self-love, and an appreciation of others? Parents? Please, what do they know about parenting? Which is why forward-thinking states like California passed the California Hitler Youth Act. Sorry, the California Healthy Youth Act. That, that was an honest mistake and not at all pre-written in the teleprompter. Anyway, the California Healthy Youth Act requires California public schools and charter schools to provide comprehensive sexual education for K through 12. K. Through 12. Think of the children. Won't somebody please think of the children? Well, they're thinking of the children, all right. Uh, the ACLU provides us with some fun facts about the California Healthy Youth Act. Fun fact, abstinence only is uh, not permitted. Fun fact, religious doctrine is not permitted. Fun fact, sexual health education must respect and address the needs of students of all genders and sexual orientations. Instruction must affirmatively recognize different sexual orientations and be inclusive of same-sex relationships when providing examples of couples or relationships. It must also teach about gender, gender expression, and gender identity, and explain the harm of negative gender stereotypes. Now, in some cases, the parents can opt out of this material, but the bill does prohibit parents from opting their children out of materials that discuss gender, gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation because Drag Queen Story Hour isn't mandatory enough. And increasingly, those ideas are being expressed and promoted in children's books and children's programming. But it certainly doesn't stop with sex or gender courses, as our students are indoctrinated into a whole host of anti-Christian ideologies, such as the A Historical 1619 Project and the peddling of anti-racism, which is all the rage. I read an interesting Substack article by Paul Rossi, who is a teacher at Grace Church High School in Manhattan, which is neither gracious nor a church and could only be a slightly bigger misnomer if it was an elementary school in Queens. He writes... In their classes and other discussions, they must never challenge any of the premises of our anti-racist teachings, which are deeply informed by critical race theory. 
These concerns are confirmed for me when I attend grade level and all school meetings about race or gender issues. There I witness student after student sticking to a narrow script of acceptable responses. Teachers praise insights when they articulate the existing framework or expand it to apply to novel domains. Meantime, it is common for teachers to exhort students who remain silent that we really need to hear from you. Every student at the school must also sign a student life agreement, which requires them to aver that the world as we understand it can be hard and extremely biased, that they commit to recognize and acknowledge their biases when it comes to school and interrupt those biases and accept that they will be held accountable should they fall short of the agreement. A recent faculty email chain received enthusiastic support for recommending that we officially flag students who appear resistant to the culture we are trying to establish. When I questioned what form this resistance takes, examples presented by a colleague included persisting with a colorblind ideology, suggesting that we treat everyone with respect, a belief in meritocracy, and just silence. And the proliferation of critical race theory is only increasing in our culture. And we'll get into that more at a later date. But if you're unfamiliar, critical race theory is the super serious theory that all time, matter, energy, and space is racist, including your mother. And if you think I'm joking, uh, you haven't been paying attention. Uh, here's my favorite, a real headline from Food and Wine. The difference between yams and sweet potatoes is structural racism. Now, as Christians, we know that this is nonsense. We know that in Christ, there's neither sweet potatoes nor yams. But in all seriousness, we do need to teach our children sound doctrine and oppress upon them the truth because the culture in academia, media, entertainment, and public library drag queens are targeting and actively trying to indoctrinate the children to be their foot soldiers in the culture war. And we need to respond. And we can do that with the help from our sponsor today. Appropriate in the Culture is brought to us by my books. <laughs> what? Oh, oh man, that's embarrassing. I, I, I had no idea. Fight back against the culture with quality Christian fiction fitting for kids and adults. Available right now on Amazon with 100% zero twerking guaranteed. Empower your story hour with The End of Magic or The Witch, The Gargoyle, and The Perfectly Perfect Man. And the best part is all proceeds go to paying my mortgage. Such a good cause. Alrighty, so I'm naturally being a little facetious in the shameless promotion of my books, but it is a means of practicing what I'm preaching. If we're going to appropriate the culture, we need to engage in it. So not only is it an alternative content that I'm comfortable with my kids reading, but it's also a countercultural move as the message and themes of these books are addressing what I think are real issues in the culture from a Christian perspective. And I think we need more of that, not less. But you'll notice I said alternative content, which is different than what we've been addressing when it comes to evangelism. Now, to be clear, I, I think that Christian art does need to be evangelical if it's going to attempt to shape the culture, but not exclusively. As I said before, th there's room for Christian music made for Christians and Christian movies made for Christians and Christian books made for Christians that are safe and edifying and deepen our faith. The world can corrupt, and so we do need to be prudent and careful and guard ourselves, and I think that's particularly true when it comes to children. Believe me, my kids are homeschooled. They're plenty sheltered because I don't think they're ready yet to stand up against the forces of our culture, and so I totally support homeschool, private Christian education. This is war. And children don't belong on the battlefield if we can help it. They need maturity and training first. They need indoctrination, which may be a weird thing to say, but indoctrination is from the Latin meaning to teach. It is impressing on them our doctrine. One way or another, children are going to be indoctrinated. The only question is, who's doing the indoctrinating? You know, as God prescribes in Deuteronomy, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. And as it says in Psalms, how can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. The spiritual disciplines are our inoculation against the world. As we become more like Christ, we can live in like he did without becoming of. 
But exposure and consumption of the culture is still important. A Pew Research study with USA Today said that 70% to 75% of the youth leave the church after high school. And people don't get it. They go, wait, 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 wait. They were in church. They went to a Christian school. They went to Christian camps, watched Christian movies, listened to Christian music. What happened? Well, that just means that they were successfully quarantined, but they were never successfully immunized. They didn't grow. They didn't mature. They didn't take their faith seriously. They didn't think about their faith seriously. They just believed because everyone in their bubble believed. And they never heard a full-throated argument against it. And when they finally did, they didn't have an answer. See, that's the other thing about consumption and exposure. It's a defense. I, I've been exposed. I know what the world thinks. I know why they think it. I've read their books. You know, they really don't read ours, especially my books. No one reads my books. But the point is, we can know their arguments, but they don't know ours because they don't bother to. And that's an advantage if we want it. And again, I'm not saying that we wantonly expose ourselves or our kids to the culture. I mean, heck, there's, there's Bible stories that we don't initially share with young kids. But that doesn't mean we won't get to it. You know, I want my kids to know how to swim, but that doesn't mean I just chuck them in the ocean and see what happens. But I do want them to be acclimated to the water so that they know how to swim. Oh, there are certainly dangers about going in the water. You can get caught up in the current of the culture and you can drown. Yes, you can. But we can be so afraid of that that we never step foot near the water. And the thing is, the water is the most dangerous when we don't know how to swim. Well, we'll stop there today. If you like what we're doing here, like, subscribe, rate, and review. Tell a friend. And if you're inclined, hey, buy one of my books and help pay my mortgage. And I'll see you next week for more Appropriating the Culture.